Testing one, two, three. was created to shed light on different societal issues which have been at the forefront of public discourse through one of the most divisive times in American history. More so, it was created with the intent of allowing those that have often been neglected, shunned, or misunderstood to have a chance to share their experiences and thoughts. I hope that this dialogue encourages critical conversation and activism amongst all listeners. And I hope you'll tell all of your friends and family about it and share it on your social platforms. Now, let's get into some current events. The Nobel Committee awarded the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize to Dr. Dennis McQuaigie and Nadia Murad because of their continued efforts to end rape as a weapon of war. Nadia Murad survived sexual violence by the Islamic State in 2014 when she was abducted alongside thousands of other girls in her homeland of northern Iraq. The minority group in which she identifies with, the Yazidi, have been consistently targeted by ISIS. And rape is the main tool of destruction that's used against them. When majority of the women eventually escaped captivity, most of them refused to be named obviously for safety purposes. However, Ms. Murad insisted upon being named and photographed. Through her advocacy, the U.S. Department of Justice determined that ISIS's actions against Yazidi and many other minority groups in Iraq and Syria constitute as genocide, making this the first time since 2004 that the U.S. has declared a genocide. Honestly, props to her because it takes a brave individual not only to share their story against this militant group, but afterwards take proactive steps in order to make sure something like that happened to her doesn't happen to any other young girls. Dr. Dennis McQuaigie, a physician, focused his efforts in his home country of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Congo has been referred to as the number one rape capital of the world and the most dangerous place for a woman to live. McQuaigie has performed surgery on countless numbers of women and advocated on their behalf in order to bring much needed attention to the violence against women by armed rebels. Often hailed as the Dr. Miracle, his capability to repair extensive damage to women that have been mutilated is just one of the many reasons he was chosen for this award. And after founding his own hospital, I mean, he literally has his own hospital, how incredible is that? It has grown to serve 400,000 people and other patients from neighboring countries. Both of these individuals have risked their own personal safety and the safety of their loved ones to be public servants that wish to bring justice to some of the places that need it the most and awareness on the horrific crimes that women worldwide have to encounter each day. Their continued efforts are the type of holistic measures we as citizens have to take for equity and justice to be thought of and implemented for everyone, and not just one certain demographic. Now, while I definitely would love to focus on these two specific individuals, and maybe we could honestly do an episode on them, I wanted to focus this specific episode because we are in the holiday season 
and all of these celebrations are occurring, I want to focus on the different holidays that many people observe during this time period. I also want to emphasize the importance that even though Christianity is the number one practiced religion in this country, with two thirds of the population identifying as such, there are different holidays celebrated in the November December timeframe that often get overlooked or just are unheard of for some. Demographics around us have been shifting rapidly, and it's a fair assertion to make that while Christianity may be the number one practice religion in our country, not everyone around us subscribes to Christianity or any religion for that period. Because of that, while it might be difficult in some ways for everyone to accept the changing demographics in terms of religious identification, it doesn't mean it's impossible. One particular aspect I took it upon myself to do is to simply wish people happy holidays if I don't know what their religious affiliation is. While it might seem a small thing to do, I do so not because I'm anti-Christmas, if anything, I love Christmas, I love the holiday season, but because it's inclusive and recognizes that there are many different ways in which people celebrate the holidays. While I understand that Christianity has dominated America for centuries, you have to acknowledge that as the people around us are evolving and bringing variations to our landscape, so should our attitudes towards those differences and the people that have them. Now, let's get into these specific holidays. At any time of year, a visitor to India can be overwhelmed by its beauty and color. But a visitor in late fall is especially fortunate. The temperature will have cooled down, the monsoons will have not yet begun, and Diwali, the festival of lights, is at hand. Diwali is to many Indians what Christmas is to Christians. In essence, it commemorates the victory of the forces of light over the forces of darkness. The Festival of Lights, also known as Diwali, is a significant event for Hindus that was celebrated this year on November 7th. The specific date of the festival varies upon the Hindu lunar calendar, but it typically occurs between October or November. The festival takes place for five days with the biggest celebrations happening on the third day. And throughout the five days, clay lamps are lit on homes, temples, and public places to commemorate the victory of good over evil. Diwali also celebrates the goodness of wealth and prosperity, Lakshmi. Now, as someone that studied religion in college, taking a class on Hinduism in particular was by far one of the most insightful and eye-opening classes I got to take because not only did I learn a great deal about the religion, I learned a lot about the systemic oppression of women and young girls in India that's not often talked about in mainstream media. If you want to know specifically about the systemic oppression they face, a good source I would recommend is the movie Water which details the intricate depictions of marriage and gender roles. Y'all, it is such a good movie. We watched it in class for two days and it was incredible. I would highly recommend it. You can literally find it on the internet or possibly your local library. It doesn't matter. Highly recommend watching the movie Water. Now you may have heard of Kwanzaa, that celebration that coincides with Christmas and Hanukkah. You may have even been to a Kwanzaa celebration. In the 80s and 90s, Kwanzaa was everywhere. But do you really know what this holiday is about and why it started? Let's jump back a few decades. In 1965, tensions between black communities and law enforcement reached a boiling point, and Los Angeles saw the most violent urban riot in 20 years. As the Watts riots unfolded around him, LA-based PhD student and activist Molana Karenga saw an opportunity to restore unity in black communities and foster African-American cultural institutions, values, and traditions. 
Another major holiday that takes place during winter months is Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa is a week-long celebration that takes place across the U.S. and other countries amongst populations of African descent. The tradition honors the first harvest celebration in Africa that took place across African countries for thousands of years. Kwanzaa is not a religious holiday and was created by Dr. Maulana Karenga in the 60s as a way to honor African values and the progress African Americans were fighting for in the midst of the civil rights era. The holidays emphasizes seven principles that are celebrated over the course of the week. The first principle, Umoja, means unity. Kuji Chagalia, which means self-determination. Ujima, which means collective work and responsibility. Ujama, which means cooperative economics. Nia is a sense of purpose. Kumba is creativity. And Imani means faith. The biggest feast, Karamu, allows families to gather in celebration and dawn colors of red, which represents the bloodshed and fight for freedom, green, the fertile soil in Africa, and black, the color of our skin, in honor of Marcus Garvey's Black Nationalist Movement. While I never personally have celebrated Kwanzaa, many of my friends faithfully have. And I honestly would love to see the holiday gain more recognition and appreci appreciation against Black and non-Black people as well because it's representative of many different cultures that fight for equality. And so the wheel turns. There's no escape from the wheel of life. There's no escape from suffering. Listen to me, Siddhartha. I am Mara, Lord of Hell. I know what I'm talking about. But I've got to admire your determination. You've been sitting there for weeks hoping that a solution to life's problems will drop into your lap like a ripe fig. Give up now and save yourself the effort. Wiser men than you have tried and failed to find an answer. And you will fail too, Siddhartha. And so the wheel turns. Another holiday I want to focus on that's not talked about a lot, but is representative of the fourth most practiced religion in the entire world is Bodhi Day. Bodhi Day translates to enlightenment in Sanskrit and celebrates the day Siddhartha Gautama sat under the Bodhi tree, which is a sacred fig tree, and attain enlightenment. Buddhists honor this moment as the foundation on which Buddhism was built upon approximately 2,500 years ago. This day allows Buddhists to affirm their dedication to Buddhism, enlightenment, compassion, and kindness to other living creatures. For those of us that might be unfamiliar with Buddhism altogether, 2,500 years ago, Siddhartha left his ascetic lifestyle of luxury and privilege and sought his one true goal of true understanding. He did this by only eating one grain of rice a day. He would sleep on nails. He would walk and walk for miles on end or he would simply just stand on one leg. Buddhists today celebrate Bodhi Day by decorated, decorating sacred fig trees with beads and multicolored lights. They also put reflective mementos that represent the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Tonight is the seventh night of Hanukkah, and here to sing a Hanukkah song is Adam Sandler. That was good. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, well, uh, when, when I was a kid, uh, th th this time of year always, 
always made me feel a little left out because uh, uh, in school there were so many Christmas songs and all us Jewish kids had was the song dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I wrote a brand new Hanukkah song for you Jewish kids to sing and I hope you like it. <clears throat> Put on your yarmulke, here comes Hanukkah. So much funnukkah to celebrate Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the festival of lights. Instead of one day of presents, we have eight crazy nights. <laughs> but when you feel like the only kid in town without a Christmas tree, here's a list of people who are Jewish, just like you and me. <laughs> Lastly, I want to focus on Hanukkah. It's actually really cute because the little girls I, I babysit are Jewish and they're always asking me every day, Hannah, are you Jewish or are you Christian? What are you? What do you and your um, family celebrate? And I get to tell them, well, we're Christian, we celebrate Christmas, and the little girls do as well because their mom is Christian. And it's just very insightful to see how these young children, although they are only two and four, they're so interested about the religions of other people and how other people celebrate the holidays. I got to teach the four-year-old literally last night what Kwanzaa was, and she was so fascinated. She was like, so only african Americans celebrate it? And I was like, typically, yes. And she was like, so you're technically from Africa. And I was like, well, technically, I don't know my origin, but if I had to guess, I would assume so. And she was like, so then all of the African people came to Houston? And I was like, no, Serena. They went all different types of places. But I say that to say it was really cute to see that although she is only four years old, she is deeply, deeply concerned about how other people's lives are lived in comparison to hers. And I just thought that was very insightful because she's only four, but she's already wondering how other people celebrate different things. But let's get back to Hanukkah. Hanukkah is an eight day festival that typically falls in late November to early December that, commem that commemorates the rededication of the second temple in Jerusalem that was damaged during the Maccabean revolt. During the rebellion, there was only enough sacred oil to last a day. But the oil lasted an extra seven days instead, which was considered a miracle. Because of this, for each eight days, people celebrate Hanukkah by honoring light and oil to give thanks. It begins on the first night when a menorah is lit with the first candle and a candle is added each day of the festivities to symbolize the number of days that the temple was lit. While some might think it's mundane to describe each of these holidays, I wanted to shed light on the importance of understanding that while we may not believe the same thing specifically, it's important to be familiar with the religious and non-religious tra traditions that people all around us celebrate. What's even more important is that each of these holidays, religious affiliations, etc., get the same amount of representation and recognition as holidays and religions that belong to a wide array of people. Personally, I grew up in a Christian household and only learned about Christmas as a young child. I can always remember assuming that everyone around me celebrated the same holidays that I did, and that those who didn't had something wrong with them, or weren't as morally upright as I was. As I've grown older though, the people that share different religious ideologies than myself have made some of the most impactful impressions on myself and my opinions. Not only that, actually studying religion in college helped me not only realize the societal implications, both negative and positive, that have occurred because of the religious disparities, particularly in the United States. 
Religion has had a monumental impression, not just on the U.S., but other global communities as well. It's led to destruction, war, suffering, and caused peace and optimism. Ultimately, no matter how distinct our religious beliefs might be, acknowledging and respecting the beliefs of others is not only the morally right thing to do, but the equitable thing to do as well. I hope that this episode causes everyone to look at their innate biases towards those with a different religion and question for themselves why it may be hard to accept someone that's not like us. I hope that this makes each of us very aware that not all ascribe to the same faith as the majority, and that's not an inferior thing. Remember, all of these opinions are my own, but they should be everyone else's. Have a woke Wednesday. Thank you for another Woke Wednesday. Transcripts of entire episodes will be available on the Woke Wednesday website. Episodes are written and produced by Hannah Mason and Trey Leonard of Lenico Entertainment. Episodes are hosted by Hannah Mason and edited by Trey Leonard. All graphics are designed by Anna French.